Once thought of as mermaids, little was known about manatees for centuries. But today, the world's foremost expert on manatees is Dr. Buddy Powell, and he's also the director of the Sea to Shore Alliance. Buddy, it's great to see you again. Hey, Jeff, it's good to see you, too. It's good to be back. The last time we were here, we were discussing manatees, and right. I understand since then, it's been two years, you've been doing a lot of work in Cuba. Tell us about that. Yeah, actually, I've uh, been working down in Cuba for about 10 years um, on manatees, and as it turns out, Cuba has an incredible amount of excellent manatee habitat, but we didn't know anything about the status of manatees there and I've been working with the University of Havana and, and colleagues and there do seem to be a lot of manatees but there's still hunting pressure going on there they're still killing them um, but the really interesting thing about it since we've been there we know that at least one manatee uh, I told him I said if you ever see a manatee that's got scars on it where it's been hit by boat it's probably not from Cuba, it's probably from Florida, really? and they got a report of a manatee that had a lot of boat scars on it, and so one of the biologists went out, and I happened to be in Cuba at the time, went out and took some photographs of it. I brought those photographs back to the U.S., and we ran it through a computer system that matches up, it's like face recognition, matches up these scars, and as it turns out, this female manatee is one that I had photographed back in 1978. Wow. in Crystal River, Florida. Now she had continued to come back to Crystal River and so forth, but um, she made her way to Cuba um, and had a baby with her um, that she you know, probably had in Florida. So we know that there's some population exchange of manatees between Florida and Cuba, and that's something we never, never knew before. In fact, the Florida manatee is considered a uh, distinct subspecies from those in Cuba. So we might, might actually be questioning that a little bit, that uh, this is really a shared population between okay. between Cuba and Florida. And it's not uncommon for them to travel that distance? It's not for unusual distance. for them to travel long distances. Um, you know, in fact, they come up to the Potomac and they come up as far north now as Massachusetts, oh, wow. which is unusual. Um, that's fairly, fairly recent. Um, but crossing deep blue water, we've had a few sightings in the Bahamas, um, rarely, but uh, this is the first time that we know that a Florida manatee has shown up in, um, in Cuba. Yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. When we last talked, I know that your study of manatees has taken you literally all over the world, and, and, uh, but manatees is not, only the, is, is not the only thing you study as far as uh, species, uh, marine species. So uh, you were telling us about uh, sea turtles that you also study all sorts of different mm -hmm. uh, species of sea turtles and particularly the effects of lighting at night on the beach. Tell us, uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, Sea to Shore Alliance, we have an interesting project. One of the main issues along um, the coast where sea turtles nest is that lighting on the beach and also the glow behind the beach is that when the baby turtles emerge from, from the nest, they become disoriented um, and they'll actually you know, start moving in the wrong direction, you know, towards a parking lot that has street lights on it and so forth. And, and of course, they get trapped up there and die if they can't find their way back, back to the water. So one of the projects that, that we have, um, we use um, video cameras that are linked together with a GPS system that's linked together with a very um, uh, high resolution light metering system. And we fly at night along the coastline and what we can see are those problem areas mm. uh, where there's so much light being shown on the beach or out to sea that it's very likely to cause the sea turtles to disorient. And, and what can you do? I mean, uh, you know, presumably a city like Fort Lauderdale would be a good example in Florida and you can't exactly turn all the lights off. Right, but what they can do is um, they can shield the light so it, the light stays, you know, primarily you know, off on the land. on land or off the beach, or they can actually change the type of lighting um, to a type of bulb that's been identified that the sea turtles don't react to. So the light frequency, the range of, of light is such that um, it's less likely to cause issues with uh, turtles being attracted to it. So there, there are some things that, that can be done. And it's, and it's interesting because as we fly along the coast, because most of the um, monitoring lights along the beach is done from land. We're kind of doing it from the sea turtle perspective as we fly along the Makes beach. Sense. 
And so you can you can really see, uh, you know, from the air, um, you know, this is a very dark beach. Even though there are hotels and so forth behind it, you can see where they have been very successful in in changing the way that they light up the beach. And then you'll you'll get to an area probably crossing a county line or something, and 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 it's. You know, I hate to say it's light and day, but it's, but it's very noticeable, the differences. And, um, and we'll later take that information and look at sea turtle nesting and provide that to either municipalities or the state or federal agencies that are uh, responsible for you know, helping to regulate the lighting on the beach. It's amazing the reach that, that, that we have as humans on, on wildlife that you don't think about. I mean, yeah. outside of pollution and, and right. all the other things that affect the marine environment, but lighting of all things. And, 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 Switching uh, to, to another topic, but related to, to, to man's effect on a, on a species, uh, the right whales is another thing that I know you're very passionate about and studying. What I didn't know is how highly endangered they are. Yeah, in fact, most people um, haven't even heard of right whales, and it's a, it's a very large baleen whale, and it feeds on uh, plankton. And it's called the right whale because, you know, when whales were hunted and you would harpoon them, they would float to the surface as compared to sinking to the bottom. And they also tended to be in, inshore whales. And so they were the right whales to try and catch. Not when a good were, quality. Not a, no. no. Right, right whale. Yeah, and so their, their numbers were just absolutely you know, decimated in the 1800s and early part of um, the 20th century. And so their population has been very, very slow to recover you know, since protection. In fact, there's only about 400 of individuals really? left in the North Atlantic, and um, so any uh, deaths or any mortality, particularly of females and calves, can have a, a major impact on a population that's so small. And does your work actually uh, not only study the right whales, but are you involved actively in, in ways to keep them from, yeah. from, from getting uh, killed? Yeah, the, the research that we're doing and the work that we're doing down in uh, the southeast U.S., off of South Carolina and Georgia, and uh, to some extent Florida, it's cooperative among a number of organizations and agencies. During the summertime, they're up north, off of Maine and Nova Scotia, where they're feeding, and then during the winter, they travel to the off the coast of southeast U.S. to um, have their babies to calve. And so what we're doing is we're flying surveys and transects off the coast and off southeastern U.S., and uh, when we see whales, you can identify them because they have these white markings called callosities. So we know the individuals, um, and that information is used to look, look at reproduction. And also, we're looking at areas where there are um, a higher density of, of whales and where there might be a lot of shipping traffic, mm -hmm. um, so that you know, we might be able to uh, work with the agencies to shift shipping to some extent because the major causes of mortality for the right whale are entanglement in fishing gear and also ship strikes. Um, and then the other thing that's done is as we're flying and when we see whales, that information is transmitted um, to um, the Coast Guard and the Navy that then sends out a notice to mariners. So the ships know where so not the to go. To that's right. So alter course. Exactly. So that they know that there's whales here so then they can alter their course. And so it's, um, it's more than just going out and collecting data and research and information, but it's, it's close to real time, um, you know, alerting that there's, you know, this is a place that, uh, you know, ships may want to um, you know, divert their path and to keep from striking them. You know, as passionate as you are, and it's now over 40 years in your career studying marine wildlife, it must be quite uh, rewarding to see the active results such as diverting shipping or changing light bulbs and little things that for man don't take much effort, but for right whales or sea turtles or manatees would be would be major yeah. uh, for, their, for the future of their species. Buddy, it's great to see you again. I want Good to, to see you. you for um, coming in. And, thank uh, you very much. I hope you enjoyed seeing Dr. Buddy Powell, and uh, you can visit Sea to Shore Alliance to follow more about his work. I'm Tucker Thompson. Thanks for joining us.